Uh, welcome, everybody. Hello, and thank you for, among all other interesting talks that we are having on Drupal Phone in Barcelona, you choose to dwell into the topic of accessibility uh, with me and how to make the internet and the world a bit better for uh, everyone. Two cents about me. Uh, my background is more in translation and technical writing, but I'm a big open source and technology enthusiast. At the moment, I'm working at the University of Barcelona, um, Web and Data Visualization Director uh, Statistical Office. And for the last year, I've been collaborating with uh, Foundation for Learning Equality, making KLLite, which is the lightweight server for Khan Academy uh, video content uh, offline. Uh, server for that content, and I was working, I'm still working in making the, it more accessible. So, I'm far from being an expert. Most probably, a lot of uh, you have more in depth technical knowledge than me in how to make accessibility work. I'm really passionate about it, and I'm just following the footsteps of like minded folks. Uh, what are we going to cover today? Who main points? For whom are we actually doing the accessibility for? Uh, why do we bother? What are the benefits and what are the misconceptions of uh, for accessibility? How do we make it possible? More in a sense of strategy and best practices, and some tannish tips for accessible content. I will present resources that will be included into the uh, the presentation but I will not go too deep into, uh, into the code itself. So, who do we do actually accessibility for? Now, uh, the latest World Health Organization uh, fact sheet report from 2014 says that it's more than over the billion people, about 15% of the uh, world's population have some form of disability. That means that between 110 and 190 million adults have a significant difficulties in functioning. 15% of the world population. That's like another stat from uh, EU statistics on income and living conditions. We have 8.5% have severe limitations and 175 have moderate limitations in everyday activities. These are for European adults over 16. If you do row numbers, that's almost one in four. Over 100 million people in uh, European Union, 27 countries. There is a strong correlation between age and disability, so further we go, change demographics, the numbers increase. When we go into nitty gritty, we are normally presented with different types of uh, disabilities. First, you can have temporary disability. You can break an arm, have a problem with your eye or with hearing, so you are basically just for the time being. Then you can have, by design, by decision actually, as this blogger who, uh, for, uh, to test herself, try to wear an eye patch, eye patch for a week and learn that empathy is crucial. You can have it also situational. For example, I have a sensitivity to the sunlight and making uh, me read on the beach is a mission impossible. You were actually asked why did I on earth decided to live in Barcelona, but I must be a masochist. Anybody here uh, taller than ten, the six feet? You probably feel pretty disabled every time you go into a low cost flight. So I feel for you. And then we have people who have permanent disability. So for those people, technology is a lifeline. Uh, John Riordan is one of the few people in this world who's born without limbs. And for her, in her words, Technology is the limb that she never had. She has recently, only 19, she's a disability rights campaigner, and he's, she's been awarded one of Outstanding Young Person the World Awards. 
So we all, regardless of age, language, physical ability, mental ability, legal literacy, can have specific needs at some point of our lives. We further have, we have further, sorry, presented with this order or types of disabilities. So you have a visual disability, auditory, mobi mobility, and cognitive disability. If we go and uh, talk about visual disability, that includes blind, people with low vision, reduced field of vision, sensitivity to flashes, glares, cataracts. They use several assistive technology devices. They could be screen readers, braille displays. Generally, between three or four people, according to statistics for US, UK, Canada, cannot see well enough to read. And here also, the incidence increases with age. But even more than visual, the people with difficulty in seeing, we have people with difficulty hearing. Numbers also vary from four to five people, uh, percent of people. And here also the incidence increases sharply over 60. And we have uh, over 20% affected when, they, when they're over 75 years old. When we talk about mobility, uh, we have the dexterity difficulties. Seven to 10% of working age adults have a severe dexterity difficulty. This include people who suffered from stroke, traumatic brain and spinal cord injuries, cerebral palsy, various, various types of dis, uh, muscular dystrophy, sclerosis, even arthritis, arthritis. Those people uh, have severe difficulty using uh, mouse, so they will probably be using some kind of assistive technology, uh, even just uh, navigating by keyboard, or using a mouse stick, some kind of head warm, or an eye tracker instead. Even more people suffer from cognitive disabilities. So just thinking about reading difficulties, we have numbers up to 20%. People have reading difficulties, including dyslexia. And another 20 or 30 have limited literacy skills. So this doesn't even include various types of cognitive disabilities like dementia, which come more with age. So for me, the most important argument in whole accessibility story is it is for everyone because we all age. So one of the last pictures I have my father a couple of months before he left us after he was struggling with Parkinson's. So at some point of our lives, sooner or later, we will all need accessibility. Coming back to numbers, another report from the Health Organization 2011 shows exactly this uh, increase in numbers. There's a strong correlation between disability and aging. By 2020, that's five years from now, a half of European adults will be age 50 or over. Another interesting data, there's, there are more prevalences higher for females, for women, uh, than for men. Changes slightly when you calculate it between countries because government compiled these statistics by um, questionnaires. So they are not standardized, but you have to take into account when you uh, have a project, what kind of audience do you have? In some countries, you will have much bigger percentage of people older who are visiting your, uh, your website or the content you are generating. If you go back to that European statistic from 2014, <coughs> When we count population over 65, we have 50 million peoples, people. 18% of our elders in Europe have severe disabilities and another 30 have uh, moderate disability. So it is for everybody. Designing for extremes make 
uh, leads to better design for everybody. Anybody here doesn't have a mobile? Okay, so that's a no. So one thing that I found out while I was researching for this presentation is that Bell actually uh, arrived at patenting telephone because his parent, his father and grandfather worked in allocation of speech technologies in the 19th century. His wife and mother were both deaf. Both deaf. So he was trying to improve the, la the life of deaf community and that's how he arrived to uh, patent the telephone. Then from Bell Labs we have uh, transistor and transistor radius. So basically, we all have marvelous mobile uh, technology today because somebody 150 years ago wanted to improve the life of that person. Another example, for example, curb cuts. Those transitions between sidewalk and street are uh, introduced for people with wheelchairs. Anybody has kids? Okay, so I guess you are very thankful for curb cuts because you have your strollers easier to walk. I'm thankful because every time I walk with the trolley, I use curb cuts. Another time, another thing that I wanted to mention is um, example of why designing for edge case for extreme is better is also seen in social level. When paid parental leave for women, it was recognized as a right, it eventually led for men, fathers, <coughs> right to ask for and expect for the same. Every time we design for an edge case, it ends up benefiting everybody. Anybody still asking why? It's good for business. You have bigger PI impact. Corporate social, you can claim corporate social responsibility. It increases market share. One example from, uh, uh, from the UK is the Tesco supermarket implemented a fully accessible website of their online grocery store. It costed 35,000 pounds to develop and ended up generating uh, uh, generates estimated annual revenue of 1.6 million, 1 million pounds. The, it's, it is also another famous example of CNET in the in US. They had 30% increase in traffic after they provided transport. So increased market share, especially because the spending power of older people, often have, they often have a larger disposable income and leisure time. So, uh, This is a number that I actually had to look how much it is in, <laughs> in euros. It says one trillion would be the aggregate annual income of uh, people with disabilities in the US. One trillion dollars. I have no idea how much money is that. Ended up being 90, 900 billion euros for UK. It is calculated that UK, the impaired and elderly have combined spending power of 300 billion euros. Benefits, search engines optimization. Did you ever try to Google uh, alt tag or alt attribute? You will get uh, results for CEO, not for accessibility. So that's one of the things that you can do to improve accessibility which will actually benefit more your CEO efforts. You can improve mobile access and overall usability. I have heard over and over from the people with uh, vision problems and blind people that they use mobile version of Facebook. They don't use uh, the full one <laughs> because the mobile one is uh, more accessible. Basic accessibility is good customer service. There's another very important uh, benefit for businesses because it reduces legal risk. So the same as gravity, it's the law. In Europe, if you have any kind of uh, services that you want to offer, present to the European uh, Union, 
Department for uh, ICT products and services, you have to observe a specific standard. Every country has, every country not, but a lot of countries have, they all have their own standards and laws. So regarding, uh, when you think about the project that you have to do, uh, check the standards and laws for your own country, because that's where uh, the le legal risk comes. In US, they have section 58, which is right scheduled for refresh in 2015. And in Spain, we have uh, a norm called UNE. Uh, there is actually one thing that I, another thing that I discovered, the Spanish Royal Decree from 2013 defines this disability not as an isolated property of the person, but it's something that surges once the person interacts with the situation with limits and they represent barriers that limit her own life. So that's actually really advanced. That's how it is included. It can represent everybody of us. We can all, at some point of our lives, have uh, encountered barriers and limits to our, uh, you know, to our you know, everyday activities. And of course, uh, web content accessibility guidelines have been accepted as an ISO standard. These are just a couple of very famous uh, legal sentences, mostly in US, uh, Netflix, after this um, uh, court case, was obligated to present captured uh, captions for their, um, uh, for their video production. So they actually have the Mm, was it a daredevil or the, the famous superhero, the blind superhero? Is it daredevil? Okay, so they will produce closed caption for this video production. And the last thing that I, I included, uh, one of the mm, accessibility consultants, Carl Groves, started in 2011 a list of various legal cases related to accessibility. In 2012, when he stopped updating, he had more than 50, mostly U.S., but they are uh, they're extending. So, how do we actually do it? The most important thing is uh, for you to remember is that it's cheaper to build accessibility feature from the get-go, from the beginning, the beginning from the beginning than to retrofit any kind of uh, digital content later. Some estimate says that if you build accessibility from the beginning, it will represent one to three percent of your global budget. If you set up to do it once it is done, it flies to 10 percent. When they tell you that that's more cost that you don't have at the moment, it will be thought included later. Just think about how many of us still try to cater to users of Internet Explorer 8 or 9? Anybody? Okay, so that's much less. Exactly, because 3% of users still browse Internet Explorer 9. Another 3 or 4 use uh, 8. So the combined uh, numbers for users of Internet Explorer 8, 9, and 10 is less than 10%. We have 15% people with disabilities. So that's one strong argument to rebut somebody's uh, example why there is no uh, budget for accessibility. Let's talk a bit of strategy and some best practices. So I hope that this part is um, inspired by a uh, really good resource that you should explore, John Carter's eight-step process for leading change. How do you make the case for accessibility in your agencies, in your projects? I hope that the first point, which is a sense of urgency, you already get that from the first part of this presentation. Accessibility is a shared responsibility. So you will have more, um, easier path if you divide it. Divide it between content managers, uh, designers, front end, back end. Each one, each group, each team will have one part of accessibility. Uh, 
Web e initiative, of, of the Web Initiative uh, has really good resources regarding how to uh, divide uh, responsibilities. You should prepare a business case. In this atmosphere, you have uh, allied, uh, allies in, in, in coalitions. Your goals, roles, and policies should be as broad as possible inside of the organization. If you have to, disguise accessibility as search engine optimization with the points that we mentioned before. Important, most important thing here is to include users any way you can. Even if you are um, experienced, you've tried screen readers, okay? It is always important to try to use somebody who is actually uh, using screen reader for everyday work, not just to test something. They will have different perspective. perspective. Don't try to fix everything at once. They probably tell you that each time when there's some kind of change management. Don't try to fix everything at once. Start with small steps and make that process a part of the culture. I know there were, there were a couple of interesting style guide talks yesterday. I'm sorry I missed that one. That's one of the options that you should explore. Make accessibility style guide for your team. Okay, so include snippets of code which could be recycled the same way you use style guide and, and cascading style sheets. That way you start with a small wins but you actually integrate accessibility into your project life cycle. That way you can ensure maintainability and the whole uh, QA process and testing. When we talk about guidelines, there are a lot of acronyms. Once you dive into accessibility, you will find guidelines, recommendations, requirements, success criteria, acronyms like WKAG, section this one, section that one. <laughs> Somebody once referred to all this new uh, terms as being forced to learn a new language for somebody who is actually trying to confuse you on purpose. Those are really, really long and complex documents. Understanding uh, web content uh, accessibility guidance uh, second version is 220 pages long. How to meet the requirements is like 385. So that's a lot. Another, another name I got for it was like, it's like, it reads like constitution. But all we who do web authoring, we didn't really learn HTML from specification. Anybody did that? Okay, so we learned it from tutorials and various other uh, resources. So don't get intimidated by the complex document, especially that happens the first time you dive into. It's like, uh, uh, this is unreadable. <laughs> Specifications do need to be complex, but you can find other resources. It has never been more easier to learn how to make websites and digital content more accessible than it is today. One of the most important things is to remember I would like to, this to be the, one of the first takeaways. Just remember this. Always remember that at the point when you make yourself a question, is this accessible? So the people have to be able to perceive it, to understand it, to do something with that content or action that's represented. And robust um, refers to being uh, available for all uh, different devices and, 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 and uh, uh, being able to sustain future. Another takeaway is that you have to think about how to offer alternatives. Never offer content in one and only one way. Just read, just sound, just seen, okay? Think that um, when you make a content available in high contrast version, okay, it will not only be benefit for those who have low vision problems, it will have benefit for people from whom, like me, they 
palm tree in highly illuminated settings on the beach or wherever. Whenever you offer time caption and transcripts, that benefits people with auditory uh, difficulties, but also serves those who, for example, prefer to, uh, sorry, this was audio versus our kids books. <laughs> Those who like, prefer to read, those who prefer to listen, for example, think about long commutes. You would prefer to have something listen and not only, uh, not only read. Caption and transcripts are the big uh, search engine benefit because that content is uh, searchable, okay? And another thing to keep in mind consistent terminology, structure, and navigation, and the language, plain language that you use for your content, that will lower your localization cost, okay? So it will benefit all the people who have cognitive disabilities, but will be a big plus for uh, your effort to make your uh, content uh, localizable. So let's try and think about Tennis tips, okay? First of all, I would like to uh, just, uh, are people here aware how does the screen reader works, for example? Okay, more or less. Think about uh, the version of your content stripped from all the style. So you just get this one linear uh, long document that's how screen reader sees. So it's really, really important to have the appropriate structure. Headings must be sequential. You should have unique and descriptive title, possibly with the tag H1. Don't jump, don't use uh, headings to style your content, okay? Style goes to CSS. Headings should be the structure of the content itself. So don't jump just for the style sake. Okay, I like this H1, but then I'm gonna put H4. No. Because screen readers are marvelous pieces of software and they uh, present a lot of opportunities for the user. They let them, if you as the content manager designers <laughs> and uh, developers make it proper, user can jump and just make uh, read headings or you can just jump from link to link, or you can jump from this section to different sections. So you have to structure your content accordingly so the screen reader can actually read in the order that you would like to, okay? So title, headings, page landmarks. You can use either HTML5 or you can use uh, ARIA. Semantic HTML gives you a lot of accessibility features for really, really uh, little development effort. So use section, header, footer, main, that is all perceived by the screen reader and presented to the user, okay? You try to think a bit like a machine, okay? It's not just enough when you think about making content accessible, it's just, just enough to think about the user with disability. You also have to think a bit like a machine, meaning that you have to know what information from your content is accessible to the computer and will be presented, in which way it will be presented to the user. I just have included uh, these links with, uh, there are a lot of really, really interesting free and open source tools, more than ever. So the um, slides will be available. Uh, you can use that. I'm not going to uh, spend more time on it. Another important point is keyboard navigation. That's mostly thought, I mean, I love to navigate by keyboard, and geeks usually do, programmers. Don't like to use the mouse a lot. <laughs> Prefer to navigate by keyboard. What to test? Uh, you should use tab and shift tab to go through links See if the order you can navigate through links is the correct one. When you are inside the menu, use arrow keys to test 
if you can access all the options inside the menus, okay? Think about including what they call skip to links, okay? So, uh, this is one menu that you include, it could be visible or invisible, you choose that. Um, people who use screen readers or are navigating by keyboard, if you don't want to have a lot of links on your, on your content, you would rather present them option to skip something and choose as you would do with, uh, with the mouse. So that's one element that should be on top, right? First element after the body tag. Access keys are debatable, use debatable, so you better avoid those. And please, 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 please define visible focus state. I hate when I, I can see and I can use my hands and I hate when I cannot see where, where is my, uh, where am I with the, with the mouse at the point? Because, or at least don't mess with the default uh, browser uh, outline for focus element, okay? Sometimes people have this really bad habit of stripping it and not styling accordingly. The best way would be to define uh, focus at the same time you uh, define uh, hover state, okay? For a really good example about uh, skip to links, try webaim.org page. It's a really, really good uh, full resources website about accessibility. Let's talk about images. So we have this elusive alt attribute, which is technically the most easier to implement, but it's uh, the most frequent accessibility fail you find when you do testing. So yeah, I know there is a real long note about discussion among Drupal <laughs> about this, and I know there are uh, things in place which would remind you each time you include the image to include some kind of alternative text. Think about describing the image, conveying both functionality and content. The good tip is try to describe the image the way you would describe it when you talk over the phone, okay? So not too extensive, but enough information so the, the whoever you are relaying that information has a good idea. Of course, localization demands you not to put text inside images, not localizable. And if you have image with purely decorative uh, uh, intention, put an empty, at least empty tag. There are other uh, options, but put empty to out tag. I can't stress enough the importance of that for search engine optimization. Remember that Google search, search alt tag, you won't find uh, results about accessibility, you'll find everything about it. <laughs> I know, I tried. Your CDN must be down, um, could be down. So that's one of the reasons why you should always include uh, alternative content for images. That's also another thing where uh, um, working group or, or HTML working group has like 45 pages long document about how to properly design, uh, describe images. So there are a lot of tools that can help you, okay? But just for a start, don't leave any uh, not described, okay? So, since we uh, touched the images, let's touch, touch color and contrast. Anybody notice this sidebar on the right? Did you notice that it was changing colors? Okay, I'm glad. So, uh, that was my intention to show you uh, what happens with people who have color blindness or more formally, color vision deficiencies. They affect roughly 10% of population, mostly men. And it is also highly dependent uh, from country to country to race to race. And another uh, imp interesting piece of information, links, originally in web history were blue and underlined, and that ended up being a great accessibility resources because color blindness for the blue hues is the most, the rarest of all others. So, and the reason they put the underline is because even those people who cannot perceive the blue color of the links can perceive it by seeing the underlined text. 
So there are a couple of types. S the most important thing here is never to convey anything just by color. Always find other way to convey the meaning. Why? Anybody from London? Okay. Do you see something special in this underground map, tube map? Yeah, lines have something specific. So this is the map which took into account that people might not be able to see differences in colors. So apart from color, they put other graphic elements which would aid people who cannot distinguish colors. Do stuff like that. Offer alternatives. When we talk about color and contrast, the best advice I can give you choose good contrast, sorry, good contrast from the beginning. It is not clear the discussion between what is better, dark on white, white on dark. People prefer different things. So as the next step, make alternative CSS color schemes and let people, users choose, okay? Somebody would prefer, I've heard both sides. So there is one, and while on some accessibility resources you will find phrases like accessibility option or for CSS. Meaning like if you offer different stuff, you cannot decide on one good contrast scheme. I not really agree with that. I would say, yeah, choose one good color contrast scheme, but then as a next step, offer different to, to your users. Somebody may prefer something that you haven't chosen as the more general option. Color and contrast have a lot of tools. Your designers, designers of your team will have, uh, in Italian they say, imbarazzo di scelta, <laughs> embarrassment of uh, options, number of options. So choose what you need, uh, what you would prefer from all that available, but choose something and use it. Since we are here to talk about in the Drupal community, I guess nobody's using uh, tables for layout. But yeah, tables are for data. Don't use them for the layout. Uh, program your, uh, in your project, include headings, caption summary, if you use tables uh, for data. Links and forms, links similar. They have to be concise, but have to be descriptive. Don't put links just text inside the link, like click or more or here. Because at the point when the screen reader user chooses just to tab navigate through all the links in a page. He or she will get just more, 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 more read from the screen reader, okay? So they have to be descriptive. Forms have to have clear labels, grouped by field sets. Don't mess with the tabbing order, okay? Unless you know what you're doing. I remember once I used uh, the tab, navigated through and it jumped on a form which was on the bottom of the page because the designer or programmer of that website choose to put <coughs> tab set uh, mm, attribute as like one or two or three and they were at the bottom of a really long page. So basically skipped all the content just to get to that form and that's not what the user was looking. Avoid captchas or at least choose the version which doesn't have accessibility issues. Think about the writing, okay? Sentences, paragraphs, use active voice, and consistent vocabulary format and navigation. That will help a lot. People with cognitive issues, everyone, and your localization costs. That's like the understandable from four principles. I occasionally use this font that may not be something that you will use often, okay? but there are a fonts designed specifically for dyslexia. Try to follow the tips from the previous page. Columns not wide, up to nine words. Divide text into paragraphs. Decide adequate length spacing if you have images. Leave enough space around that will all help. Always the line on the left, of course, that will all help uh, people who have dyslexia to understand. 
as I said, uh, there is a lot of tools and resources. I just included uh, a few of them. Uh, really nice uh, add-ons, plugins for both uh, for all um, browsers. Just remember one thing. Technical compliance does not necessarily mean functional compliance. So even if when you use and you test something and you have like all greens, just like a couple of manual checkups because a lot of those uh, tools will present you an option, so, okay, I didn't find anything which warrants an error or warning, but you should check manually stuff, okay? Even if you have all green, that does not necessarily mean that it's functionally compliant, okay? So always test in person you, and even more important, whenever you have an option, test with users. When we have, when we talk about multimedia, always think about alternatives. So if you have only audio, have the test transcript ready. It will benefit accessibility, it will benefit search engine optimization. If you have video without audio, put the test description on the side. And when you have video with audio, offer closed captions and interactive transcript. They don't autoplay. Another of please, 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 please don't do that. It takes me a moment just to wake up from the video which is played aloud, think about the person who cannot see or who cannot move, uh, the head one or, or, or eye tracker fast enough to stop the video which started played automatically. Okay, that, that's big usability issue. I always get mad when I find it. There are accessible video players, quite a lot of them. This is one uh, openly uh, available Google Doc matrix with media player accessibility comparison where you can check all the options which are included and choose the one which is uh, good for your project. There is also an accessible YouTube video player. You just plug in the link inside and it will have this uh, nice and accessible multimedia control. The Uh, you have the, uh, you can see in the first image the, how does the transcript look like. So this is not only for people who cannot hear, this only help, this also helps those who uh, would benefit from being able to read and follow. For example, think about if you don't have enough uh, budget to cover localization cost, okay? That's a huge uh, burden from a budget. But if you pre present transcript, even better, some kind of interactive transcript which will follow and uh, find uh, the phrase which is actually spoken, that will help a lot of your foreign users. Maybe they don't understand the spoken, but they can read. Another benefit. Just a quick mention, in case you use accessible PDFs, uh, always go to the source. If you need to present some kind of content in PDF format, uh, you have to make it uh, accessible in uh, Word, in Writer, in whichever application you export it from, and then export those PDF. Do not do printing, because at that point, the accessibility feature of those authoring tools are not conserved. They're actually getting pretty good. Both Office and LibreOffice have good accessibility features. Make use of them. For professionally accessible uh, PDF tools, you will have to use Acrobat Pro uh, because it has the best checkers, okay? And of course, make use of all accessibility Drupal resources. There are quite a lot lately. I've seen, this is the webinar from Mike Griffin, uh, maintainer of the accessibility module. Uh, check it out, they will present you all the options that have the people from accessibility group have been working on uh, for the last few years for uh, the organ of Drupal 8. And that will be all. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Please leave feedback on, on the website. And of course, we are, I'm open for questions. Andrew has just one quick uh, announcement to make.
Hello, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so tomorrow, if we want to carry on this kind of conversation, learn more about accessibility, uh, we do have a BOF session booked. It's going to be in room 130, and it's going to be at 1 o'clock, so at just after lunch. That's uh, the time slot just after lunch. The Radina said about uh, making allies and forming coalitions and changing the culture in organizations. So what we want to do with the BOF is really just get us all in the same room, uh, people who are working with accessibility, so we can you know, just connect with each other. What we talk about, it depends who turns up. We might be developers and designers. We might be project managers, um, content writers. Uh, so we Fashion could... Yeah, everyone. Uh, so we might look at how we're uh, moving accessibility in our own organizations and clients, uh, or we might look at what Drupal's capabilities are. Uh, the topic is up to you. But tomorrow at 1 p.m. Okay, uh, I'm open for questions. Joe. Um, he was asking, are there organizations uh, that can be contacted in case you don't have a p person with disability to help you test the website? Of course, all the countries, as far as I know, at least in Europe, have their own organization. For example, here in Spain, the big one is called ONCE, Organización Nacional de Ciegos de España, the Spanish National Organization for the Blind. And in case you need both professional advice or somebody who will put you into contact with possible testers, I'm sure you can find something in your, in your own country. Just, you know, look for your local. I mean, I, I, I even know them in Serbia, so if Serbia has, I would guess every other country has it in Europe. I will include in the presentation, I, right now I remember that there are a couple of resources of how to contact which, where to go, uh, to, to knock on doors to try to find somebody who will help you test possibly your, your content. Go. Yeah. Put the mobile designer on board, get him to be a part of your team. I mean, uh, you have to do first some evangelism in your team, okay? So the, your project will have more uh, likelihood of success if you first have allies among the uh, designers, developers, and then go to the upper management, okay? So first you have to win somebody from the design team. I don't have a, a you know, recipe. <laughs> This is the best advice I can give you. Yeah, sure, go. Oh, is this working? Okay. Um, anyone who's a web developer, uh, okay. or at least a front-end designer developer, developer, will be aware of the fragmentation of browsers, Internet Explorer, you know, Chrome, Safari, sure. et cetera. Sure. What, does something similar exist with screen readers and people's preferences? Is there one that's dominant is, or, you know? There are several. Um, it's kind of a, like uh, uh, operating system story. There used to be one big Microsoft-like screen reader. It's called JAWS. I think it's acronym for jobs for job access, something like that. Uh, which used to have like absolute dominance in the market, but it has been declining because more options uh, are there. For example, all, everything on, on uh, Macintosh platform, iPhone, iPad, uh, Macs, they have their own screen reader, and it's really, really built deep into. So, voiceover, okay? So everybody who uses Mac probably uses, and they have really, really good opinion of it, according to what I'm told. They use all voiceover. On the PC, on the PC side, 
you have jaws which have been declining. I think right now it has a market share around, I think it's 40%. Not really, won't bet my life on it, but something like that. Because uh, in the last four or five years, one have been rising because it's open source and it's free. It's called NVDA, non-visual desk, desk, desktop access. So when uh, people test accessibility, they usually, if they have access to JAWS, they use JAWS with um, Firefox, Internet Explorer, Chrome, whatever. Or you just download NVDA and test with that. There is also, I would, as a first step, I would recommend you, there is one Firefox simple plugin called Fangs. It doesn't really read, but it will present you, okay, in a sidebar, the text of what would eventually be read. It's not 100% equal or what you will get read at output from, uh, from NVIDIA jobs, but as a first step, it gives you really, for example, it helped me a lot uh, to fix some errors of uh, the dynamically, dynamically generated content in my last project. It was a Django project with a lot of libraries behind, a lot of calculations. So basically what screen reader, uh, um, there was like evaluation for, uh, for uh, um, users seeing this video 50% or this video, this exercise gain 50%. So basically screen reader before <laughs> I put my hands on accessibility, we're reading just the numbers, okay? So I first actually saw that in JAWS. I haven't even get to the testing with a screen reader. I was just like 50%, 30, 100. I was like, what is this? So it this can be a first step, okay? And then of course you have the free, the free uh, NVDA uh, screen reader which you can download, use freely. Okay. Thank you. Somebody else was over there? Yeah, sure, go. Okay. Okay, there my best advice would be, instead of looking for accessibility consultant, get a good technical writer, expert in plain language. Because they have a lot of experience in how to make content more simple, but yet still usable, even if it's... Okay. Yeah, you have like a lot of content, complex menus. That's still even more question of uh, information architecture and even somebody who is uh, experienced in technical communication. Think, think about all technical communicators deal with a lot of that stuff. Somebody who has to present a technical manual for a Boeing, okay? So that person probably has a lot of experience on how to structure, well-structured information, especially if you have different kind of stakeholders and readers, okay? So you present one content to engineer, another content to a CEO, a third content for, I don't know, somebody who wants to find out how to use reclined seats, okay? Okay, anybody else? More questions? Oh, oh, sorry, go. Um, I just wondered, um, have you come across any issues with sites that rely on advertising being less uh, uh, inclined to invest in uh, this sort of technology because... Yes, and that's it, like a big yeah. fail. And, and whether you have any uh, hit, you know, ideas about how best to... Just present so them the doing. information that people are, when are older, have more hearing problems, seeing problems, cognitive problems. And what I said before, those are the people who have the highest aggregate income, yes, leisure, time. 
So those people are more inclined to actually use your site, just you know, make them possible. I'm just thinking of the fact that screen, read, screen readers, et cetera, won't actually show them any adverts. So project, project managers, et cetera, are likely to not value them as much as users who see the adverts. Okay, I see your dilemma. And they're not thinking so, this consciously, they're not evil project managers, they just, it's just as business dictates, yeah. it doesn't get the focus it, it Yeah, needs. yeah, I understand. Just make them think that uh, I, for example, haven't seen a Google ad in ages, yeah. okay? And I'm not the only one. People have a lot of blockers, ad blockers. So think about even normal users will find a way to eventually block your, uh, block your content, you know? Okay, so I, don't, I would not take that as like in-face argument of not to invest in another possible. Uh, there are options in uh, uh, accessibility uh, guidelines, how to present content that changes, okay, which is dynamic. So technically it is. I would not um, advise that you use it necessarily in more assertive way to present uh, the ads, but you should investigate ARIA, uh, di di dynamic content, okay, and dynamic mm -hmm. roles. You could have some options to present to your uh, business stakeholders. Mm -hmm. okay. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, do come to your app session tomorrow. We'll be there.